you can see that the that the AI bots are winning, you're losing. Humanity is doomed. Welcome back to Library of Wealth. In a recent interview, Michael Saylor discusses his thoughts on the ongoing US banking crisis and why very soon fiat money will all be owned by the state. He predicts the impact of Bitcoin on the monetary system will be profound as devaluation is having a major consequences. According to Saylor, while strong nation states may still have fiat currencies, the currencies of most countries will eventually fail. He also believes the coming Bitcoin rally will have an even greater impact on the crypto market. Despite fluctuating price gains, Saylor believes the surge before the Bitcoin halving will easily surpass 10 times its current value. He also stresses the importance of properly capturing and cleaning out the crypto and digital assets ecosystem before attempting to revolutionize the entire banking industry. Let's get right into the latest interview with Michael Saylor as he gives his prediction for Bitcoin and the crypto market in the last part of 2023. If you have a million dollars of property in the state and you live in it, you pay $20,000 a year and then they reassess the property up if, you, if, if you're not a citizen, which means that over the course of about 20, 25 years, you have to have a million dollars to pay taxes on a million dollars of property you own. If you started with a million dollars, you have nothing, you see, after 25 years. Uh, the old uh, axiom in America is they lost the family farm because they couldn't afford the taxes on it. When I was growing up, we, you know, people told us a story. We just nodded our heads and we just kind of accepted that as a given. Well, of course, and the, and the establishment would like you to believe that there's something morally, uh, morally wanting about the about the grandchildren that couldn't afford to pay the tax on the family farm. They must be lazy or they must be uh, they must be less virtuous than their grandparents that could afford to buy the farm. But if you think about it, you're like, why is it that, that your grandchildren or your great grandchildren will be poor when you and they'll lose everything that you worked your entire life to get just because of the passage of time? Oh, but over the course of 100 years, the, the way the political system is constructed, all of the money that you work for will be transferred from your family to the state, either by inheritance taxes, property taxes, or inflation, one way or the other. You know, and, uh, and that's been normalized somehow, somehow. But um, if you think about what happens when you go from a uh, visible stationary property which invites looting to uh, invisible mobile property. Bitcoin is invisible mobile property. Nobody knows you have it. And if you if you um, made it in one city, you can move it to a different city, a different state, a different country, right? And so there's there's something fundamentally different here. When when a when an ambitious person, a, po a politically powerful, ambitious person meets someone with a lot of money that can't run, their reaction is, let's tax them and take it because it's unfair that they have it and I don't. And they, sometimes they just want it. And sometimes they go, it's unfair that this wealthy person has it and there's someone that isn't wealthy like them. So I'm going to tax it as a public service and I'm going to redistribute it from the person that has it to the person that doesn't have it. And I'll, of course, I'll give myself a cut in the middle. That, that is the status quo since the beginning of time. But of course, when an ambitious, powerful person encounters someone that has a bunch of wealth that's invisible, that's mobile, instead of viewing them with contempt, they're viewed uh, with respect. And uh, if you want an example in the real world where you can see this uh, put to the test, look at the policies of Singapore and the UAE and compare them to the policies in in certain states in the United States or certain parts of the US and then Western Europe. And of course, what you'll see is uh, in Singapore and the UAE, they have zero in income tax, very low tax rates, and they welcome foreigners. Because if they, ha if they had massive taxes, no one would take their billions of dollars of property to Singapore, would they? <laughs> they don't need to. They're trying to at attract liquid capital by being civil and cooperative. Whereas you go to, you know, states like 
New York, California, where they think that people sort of just have to stay there, the tax rates just keep going up and keep going up and keep going up. Same in lots of parts of Western Europe. And uh, the more comfortable the politicians are that you can't leave, the higher the tax rate goes. So Bitcoin represents a lot of things. And one, one thing it represents is the separation of money and state. And a lot of people, they like it because they think, well, if the, if the money is separated from the state, the state can't print infinite money to fight endless wars. That's true. Another thing it represents is the separation of property from Earth. And it's even, a, I think it's even a bigger, deeper concept, right? And the idea of separating property from Earth is if your property isn't stationary to a given physical jurisdiction, then you don't have to negotiate with the mayor, the governor, the president, and every regulator in the regime in order to just keep from losing your stuff every day of your life. They understand inherently now the danger of organizations getting too big and too powerful because ultimately that organization that controls how a billion people think is run by one person with four people advising them at the top. And so is it really wise for four people or one person to decide what a billion people can think and say and do and or whether or not they should smile or what they should wear? It's always corruption, always monopoly, always taxation. There is no end to it. There never has been an end to it. There never will be an end to it as long as we are physical creatures and we live in the physical domain. So what what is the appeal of Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is the digital transformation of property, the digital transformation of money, leading to the digital transformation of energy and matter, and then eventually the digital transformation of identity. And um, so I think the entire crypto movement is a backlash against that. Last I checked, there are north of 400 million people that have some crypto involvement that have embraced it. You know, hundreds of millions of Bitcoin holders. Saylor remains bullish on Bitcoin and echoes the sentiment of many high profile investors, saying that the crash of the US dollar will lead to a rally in Bitcoin, the likes of which the world has never seen. Saylor suggests investing in scarce profitable assets that are free from counterparty risk. He notes that the global demand for a stable digital currency is growing as countries are facing currency instability. He believes that Bitcoin will thrive as a valuable asset because it's validated and supports an entire class of assets, according to Saylor. While strong nation states may still have fiat currencies, the currencies of most countries will eventually fail. He advises against holding cash that rapidly loses 20% of its value per year and believes that maintaining generational wealth requires purchasing desirable assets with low-cost money and holding on to them forever. What do you think about the latest interview with Michael Saylor? And what are your thoughts on his insights into the paradigm shift driven by Bitcoin's emergence and its impact on crypto investment strategies globally? Comment down below. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content just like this. We'll see you in the next video.